Hello, and welcome once again to Lay Toes Law. I'm Steve Lay, attorney at law in the state of Michigan. I've been practicing law now for 24 years in the fields of consumer protection and lemon law. I'm a frequent writer. My stuff appears on Jalopnik. I write from time to time for Opposite Lock, and I also write books. Got a brand new one out here right now called Dodge Daytona and Plymouth Superbird Design, Development, Production, and Competition. As you can hear and see, it's in hardcover. It's on Amazon, but if you want a signed copy, I can get you one for a discount. Just email me at the address at the end of the podcast, Leto at Kenan.com. I'll hook you up at a discount. I'll even sign it for you so long as you live in North America. And if you live outside of North America, we'll have to work out some kind of swap. In fact, a good friend of mine named Simon traded me a Manchester United shirt for a book not too long ago. And uh, yes, I'm a Man U fan, even though they're struggling this year. Now, today is late till it's lower to talk about the dumbest things I've heard attorneys say. And every attorney's got stories of crazy stuff they've heard in court from clients, from judges. But yes, attorneys are not immune. Even attorneys will say stupid, stupid stuff. So today, it's the dumbest things I've heard attorneys say. And quite often, this is simply an argument they've made in court against my position. So a defense attorney will come into court and say something really, really stupid. And uh, I'll stand there, and oftentimes the judge will sit there and look at them going, are you kidding me? So my favorite, my favorite, and this tops the list, although you'll see the other ones are good too. Uh, there was an attorney who represented one of the big three automobile manufacturers. And the big three, of course, are Ford, GM, and Chrysler. I won't tell you which one because I don't want to embarrass them. But one of the big three uh, manufacturers had an attorney who would routinely come into court and say, and this is an exact quote, she would say, Your Honor, my client is not a manufacturer under the Lemon Law. All my client does is assemble the parts to cars and then sell the complete cars to dealerships. Therefore, they're not a manufacturer. Now, <clears throat> yes, that's all any auto manufacturer does is assemble cars out of parts. Uh, and in fact, Michigan's Lemon Law specifically defines a manufacturer as someone who assembles cars. I kid you not. So she would get in front of the court and say this, and I would stand up and read the definition from the Lemon Law, and the judge would then look at her and say, well, what do you have to say about that? And she'd say, well, all we do is assemble them, Your Honor. We don't manufacture them. <clears throat> so uh, she made that argument several dozen times on several dozen of my cases. It never flew once, not a single time. Now, we've all seen those films where there's people trying to build airplanes before the Wright brothers, and the thing would you know, go about three feet and crash into the ground like a ton of cement. <laughs> you would think if she made the argument once or twice and got shot down, she'd stop making it, but she didn't. She made the argument for about a year or a year and a half before her law firm got fired. And that big three manufacturer now has a different law firm that hasn't made that argument since. It's the dumbest argument I've encountered in the Lemon Law setting, but it's not the dumbest thing I've heard a, a, a defense attorney say. So like I said, I've heard others. Now, one of my favorite cases of all time is I had a client who had a uh, vehicle that had bad brakes. And this was a foreign car company. This is one of the car companies that don't sue as often. And you know, I'm in Southeastern Michigan. The bulk of my cases are American car companies. It's not because they make cheaper cars, it's because they have a larger market share, okay? But once in a while, I get a Volkswagen or a Honda or whatever in my, in my office, and this is one of those vehicles. The vehicle's got bad brakes. My client goes, it's the weirdest thing. I go to, you know, stop, and sometimes the brakes just don't work. They don't work as well as they ought to. Now, I'm skeptical of these kinds of things because brake technology's been around pretty much as long as cars have been around. <clears throat> so they've got that figured out. So when he said, I got problems with my brakes, I said, well, let me see the repair orders. Sure enough... In the repair orders were documented examples where mechanics had gotten in his car and said, yes, I test drove it and the same thing happened to me. The brakes didn't work properly. So the mechanic would then try to fix something, give it back to him, and the brakes still weren't fixed. We filed the lawsuit. The manufacturer hires an attorney. The attorney calls me up and says, Steve, we want our guy to test drive your vehicle. We don't believe there's anything wrong with your client's car. Okay? So we say, fine. We turn the car over to them. And they have it for a day, and then the attorney calls me, and he's got this really sheepish tone to his voice. He goes, Steve, we've got a problem. I go, what's that? And he said, our expert was in an accident with your client's vehicle. And I go, what happened? And he goes, well, the brakes failed. I kid you not. I said, well, great. Are you going to buy the vehicle back? And he goes, no. He goes, actually, this helps our case. And I go, why is that? And he said, because the brakes failed for our expert in a way different than the way they failed for your client. Therefore, what your client says about the brake failure is not true, but they are failing in a different way, and this is the first time they've ever failed that way. And I go, can you explain to me what the difference is between this way and that way? Because as far as I can tell, your expert just rear-ended someone in traffic because the brakes failed, and my client says it occasionally hits the brakes and nothing happens. What's the difference? 
And he said, well, we'll just save that for court. And I said, you know, why don't you do that? We'll, you know, we'll go to court. <laughs> we'll get in front of a judge. And he goes, no, no, we're going to get in front of a jury. I said, no, no, this will never get in front of a jury. I said, what's going to happen is we're going to get in front of a judge. I'm going to file a motion for what's called summary judgment or summary disposition in Michigan, where we're going to ask the judge to not even bother sending this to a jury because the case is so clear cut in our favor that your own expert proved my client's case. I said, and if you want to try to argue to the judge that there are different ways brakes can fail and it makes a difference under the lemon law, which it doesn't, I said, knock yourself out. A couple of days later, he called me back and said, ah, you know, my client, against my advice, has agreed to buy your client's vehicle back, even though I personally think there's nothing wrong with it. I said, wait, but your expert crashed it when the brakes failed. How can there be nothing wrong? He said, well, something's wrong with it, but that's the first time that's happened. Your client had a different problem we fixed, but then my expert discovered another problem with it. I said, well, I'm just glad your client didn't kill somebody in my client's car when he discovered the problem with the vehicle. Now, getting back to the client uh, of mine who had the vehicle built by one of the big three manufacturers, and the attorney for that manufacturer said, well, we just assemble the cars. We don't actually make them. Um, I had a similar argument, but this was a different attorney, different manufacturer, and this is actually with a big rig truck. And occasionally I represent people with other vehicles. I've represented all kinds of crazy stuff, snowmobiles and personal watercraft, and several big rig trucks. Guys will buy these you know, huge tractor trailers for doing cross-country you know, trucking, and once in a while something goes wrong with them. And I had a client who had a ex very, very expensive brand new tractor trailer, and for whatever reason, there was this instrument panel that didn't work. And um, <clears throat> the name of the truck company that we were suing was on the instrument panel. And so we filed this lawsuit. We're going through this case. And at one point in time, we're getting in front of the judge. And um, the judge turns to the defense attorney and goes, what's your defense on this? I mean, it looks like this thing's defective. It's been in the shop a million times. The Michigan Lemon Law doesn't apply to big rigs. So we don't have that clear cut number of times that just win, you know, we win at. But the judge was kind of asking the defendant, why are you fighting this case? What's, what's there to fight here? It looks like this thing is defective. It's never been fixed. It's something a guy paid for. Why isn't he entitled to have this thing work? And the attorney said, well, Your Honor, we didn't build that part. And I and the judge kind of both did the old double take, looking at each other going, well, it's in your truck, and it's got your brand name on it. What do you mean you didn't build it? Who cares? You warranted it. And that's the key here. The warranty applies to everything in the truck. And she said, no, no, no. They get that part from a supplier. And so it's, you know, he should be suing the supplier. Now, here's the thing. Every vehicle's got parts from suppliers. If you honestly think that Ford Motor Company is actually building every single part in your Explorer, or you know, that your car is you know, actually every single part's made by your manufacturer, uh, you got another thing coming. Your car, your car is assembled from parts that have been brought by, bought from all kinds of different manufacturers and different suppliers and vendors and so on. Some of those parts are built in other countries, as you may know. And uh, so, you know, the parts get brought to a centrally, you know, assembly point, and then the cars get built from those parts, but they're not all built by that same manufacturer. And so this attorney actually said, she goes, Your Honor, my client didn't build the dashboard in this truck. Someone else did. And the judge goes, okay, so are you saying that Mr. Leto's client should be suing the manufacturer of the, you know, the company that built, that or supplied this dashboard? And she said, yes. The judge goes, well, then who is that? I kid you not, the attorney said, we don't know. And I, I, I then clarified to the judge, I said, Your Honor, uh, she's raised this argument with me before, and I asked her specifically, who is the supplier that supplied this part? If you want me to sue them, I will, but, you know, who were they? She goes, my client won't tell me. So what, what we know about this, as you read between the lines, is, is that her client actually recognized how dumb this argument was. That if you actually think that a person who bought a defective vehicle is going to sue every vendor who supplied every part to that vehicle, uh, that ain't going to work. And it didn't work. And the case wound up settling without us ever having to sue the vendor who uh, supplied them with the parts of the dashboard. But that's a kind of idiotic argument that people will make. Now, another dumb argument I encountered once in court, I had a lawsuit against a used car dealer on the east side of Macomb County. And um, I've mentioned it here before. It's one of my favorite cases. It's the one where the vehicle my client bought uh, blew up a few days after she bought it because somebody put 90-weight gear lube in the crankcase to quiet what was probably a rod knock. And we think this because three days after she bought it, the rod let loose and pieces of the engine scattered all over the place and somehow escaped <laughs> through the bottom of the oil pan. And um, 
we went to trial on this and we won. Jury came back in our favor. And there's a whole process that most people who don't know much about the courts don't know that it happens. But when you win a lawsuit, you know, it's not like they just pull out their checkbook and cut you a check. There's a whole process you have to go through to get the defendant to pay you money. And one of the things is you have to get a judgment entered. And there's often a fight over simply entering the piece of paper that says, yes, the plaintiff won this case. So we had to have a motion for entry of a judgment because the defendant was objecting to everything I filed with the court. I could have called him up to wish him a good day and he'd object. So I filed a proposed judgment. He fought it. So we have a hearing on the entry of the judgment. So I came to court with this piece of paper that's a proposed judgment that I'm going to ask the judge to sign and stamp and make official. And that's just a, 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 you know, something that's going to happen. I mean, the guy has very little argument to stop that. But he's trying to throw up all kinds of roadblocks. So we're out in the hallway before the case gets called, and the attorney walks over to me, and he says, Hey, Steve, by the way, he goes, I'm just letting you know, you're never going to collect on this judgment. And I said, Well, if that's true, why are you objecting to it? Okay, and he said, Well, you know, my client, blah, blah, blah. They, you know, and every attorney out there blames their stupid actions on their clients. They go, Oh, my client wants me to do this. If your client, by the way, guys, and if you're an attorney, pay very close attention. If your client wants you to do something stupid, you have the right to say no. Remember, it's attorney and counselor. One of the things you are allowed to do as an attorney is to counsel your client against doing stupid things. And if your attorney wants you to go into court and make a stupid argument, it's your job to actually say to them, you know something, that is a stupid argument. Now, don't get me wrong, once in a while they throw enough money at you, I guess, you can make the argument. Or if you've got a good faith argument that has some, some merit, some validity somewhere to this, that you can make the argument. But the idea, for instance, that we don't build cars, we just assemble them, or we don't know who provided us that piece, but you should go sue the vendor. Those are such idiotic arguments. You couldn't pay me enough money to go into court and make them. I, I, I would refuse. I'd actually tell you, I'm sorry, I won't do that. If you want an attorney to do that, go find someone else, pay them, okay? But, you know, trust me, you want good legal help, sometimes they're going to stop you from making dumb arguments. So the attorney says to me, he says, well, Steve, he goes, here's the deal. You're never going to collect on this judgment. And I said, why is that? And he said... This morning, I advised my clients to go back to the car dealership. Remember, this is a lawsuit against the car dealership. And he said, and, and as you know, you're going to get a judgment against the dealership, not him personally. And I said, I understand that. And he said, well, I've advised my clients to go back to the car dealership and put sticky notes on every single car on the lot saying, this car now belongs to Corporation X. And he goes, and I've just, this morning, filed the paperwork with Lansing creating this second corporation. So this morning... My client is at the dealership. You can go there right now. I said, well, dude, I'm in court. I'm not going to leave court to go see what your client's doing at the dealership. He goes, no, no, go. you should go there right now. And I said, no, I'm not going there right now. He said, well, he's putting sticky notes on every single car and all the furniture in the office. We'll have a sticky note saying this chair, this fax machine, this coffee machine now belongs to Corporation X. And your judgment is against defendant. It's not against Corporation X. And he said, so the fact that all of our assets have now been transferred over to this other entity, when you get your judgment, it's worthless because the entity you got the judgment against is uncollectible. And um, what's interesting about this is this guy actually practiced business law. If you went to his website today, it says that, you know, here's my name. My specialty is business law. And I, and I looked at that guy and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. In Michigan, can I transfer ownership of a car with a sticky note? Is that legal? Does the Secretary of State's office on their website say one way to transfer ownership of a vehicle is to put a sticky note on it and say it belongs to someone else? And he said, well, you know, we're not talking about titling for, you know, the Secretary of State's purposes. We're talking about assets here. And I said, yeah, and the assets are automobiles. And right now, if I call Lansing and run the, you know, VINs of every single vehicle in that lot, they're all going to come back as being owned by the defendant corporation that I'm suing, right? And he said, well... We're going to fight you on that because uh, he goes, those, you know, all those sticky notes we're placing, those uh, indicate a transfer of ownership to a second corporate entity. And I said, okay, well, we'll see about that. Uh, one of the things that I also mentioned to him is the fact that all car dealers in Michigan have to carry bonds, and they're bonded. And so when you sue somebody, if they get rid of all their assets somehow, if they did it properly, uh, you can still attack the bond. But number two, of course, sticky notes don't transfer ownership. About half an hour later, we walked out of court. I had a signed and stamped and true copy of a judgment uh, entered by that court, signed by that judge. And I handed it, of course, to the defense attorney. I said, here you go. Uh, you got 28 days to pay that. Otherwise, I'm going to go there and start snagging vehicles. And I don't care if they got sticky notes on them or not. And uh, a short while later, the attorney called me up and said, well, against my advice, my clients agreed to pay you. And they paid me with certified funds. 
And that was the end of that case. And I was dying. I was dying to get into court and have the argument with a judge and say, by the way, <laughs> those sticky notes are just idiotic. I mean, come on. Transfer ownership of the vehicles via sticky note. And then finally, and this is one of those things where you really aren't sure if somebody is messing with you or they're just being stupid on purpose. And, and you know, people who are stupid on purpose really annoy me. If, if you're stupid legitimately, you, you, you actually are stupid, you're medically stupid, or whatever reason you're actually stupid, okay, or you don't understand something, that's fine. There are people out there, you know, no one's an expert on everything, okay? I'll tell you the stuff I don't know. You know, I know very little about many topics. There's, I just avoid those topics, and if I need to know about them, I go find an expert who knows about them, okay? But when people are just stupid, they just say something stupid, okay? You have to look at them and go, well, what's wrong with you? So I had a case up in Marquette, Michigan, okay? And my office is in Oakland County. And Marquette and Oakland County are about nine hours apart by car if you're driving really fast. And when we filed the case up in Marquette, I was expecting the case to settle because it was a slam dunk. And it did eventually settle, but the defense attorneys decided to make us jump through some hoops because they'll often say, hey, let's make it painful for the plaintiff. So we'll, we'll drag him to court a couple times. And so this, this judge called us up and said, would you guys... I see that you're both, the defense attorney is also out of Wayne County. The judge goes, would you guys want to do this pretrial conference, conference by phone? It seems like that would be a very easy thing for you guys to do, pretrial conference by phone. I said, I'd love to. The other attorney said, nope, Your Honor, we want to come to court. The judge said, really, why? And the attorney says, well, you know, my client likes me to go into court and, you know, get to see the judge face to face and get a lay of the land and how the courtroom looks and so on. And I think we're entitled to that. And the judge says, well, I can't, I guess I can't force you guys to do it by phone, so I guess you guys got to be here. I said, well, Your Honor, I plan on driving up. Can we make it for the early afternoon? The judge said, sure, we'll have your hearing be the first one after lunch one day. So you just got to be here by 1 o'clock. I said, I can do that. So that morning, I got up real early, slapped on my suit, jumped in my vehicle, and headed north on I-75 in Florida. And I rolled into the parking lot of the courthouse about five minutes before the hearing, uh, got out of my vehicle, put on my suit jacket, grabbed my briefcase, walked into the courthouse in Marquette. And by the way, if you ever see the movie Anatomy of a Murder, Portions of it were shot in the Marquette County Courthouse, beautiful courthouse. They've kept the courtroom exactly as it was in the movie. It's worth a visit. So anyways, I go into the courthouse, talk to the judge for a few minutes along with the opposing counsel. The judge does the, the pretrial conference. We're, we're done in like three minutes. And we're making small talk. And then out of the blue, the other attorney says, well, Your Honor, you know, he didn't drive up today. And I think it's disingenuous of the fact that, of him that, that he you know, asked for this hearing to be in the afternoon because we could have done it this morning since he flew in. And... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by this because I don't know this attorney well enough <laughs> for her to be accusing me of lying to a judge, falsely accusing me. And I, and, I, and, I, and I looked at her and I looked at the judge and I said, Your Honor, my vehicle's in the parking lot right outside the door. We can all go out and look at it, okay? If she doesn't think that I drove up this morning, then, you know, she's incorrect. And she turned to the judge and she goes, Your Honor, we don't know whose car that is. And I said, uh, I can show you a registration that matches the license plate that's in my wallet that shows you that it's my vehicle. And the judge said, no, no, guys, I don't care how you got here. We're here, we're done, go home. As we're walking in, I turned to the attorney and go, why, why would you do that? And she goes, oh, come on, Steve, you didn't drive up. And I go, my car is right there. And she goes, I don't know whose car that is. And I, and I pulled my registration. I'm trying to show her my registration. I go, that's my registration. She goes, up. Oh. And she just walks away from me. Um, so... She accused me of lying to a judge and said that she didn't know how I could possibly prove a vehicle in the parking lot was mine. And this is an attorney who represents car companies. So those are among the dumbest things I've heard attorneys say. I've heard dumber. I'm sure I have. And as they come to me, maybe I'll do a second episode of this somewhere down the road. But that'll wrap up this episode of Leto's Law. Again, a reminder, my brand new book just came out this past week. Dodge Daytona and Plymouth Superbird, Design, Development, Production, and Competition. Hardcover, as I pointed out previously. If you're interested in that, contact me at leto at and I can get you a copy discounted, signed, and sent to you. Uh, you can just go out to your own mailbox and find it there one day with my signature on it. Again, that's uh, leto at kenan.com, L-E-H-T-O at kenan.com, K-E-N-N-O-N.com. Questions or comments, look me up on my website, latoslaw.com. And of course, uh, I'm on Twitter, at Steve Leto, at S-T-E-V-E-L-E-H-T-O. This show is on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye-bye.